Try to raise the mic a little bit. <clears throat> so you know how Julie told about her people? I'm one of those people. <laughs> we, uh, we have a costume closet at home. It's a really good costume closet, but it is nothing compared to the costume closet, the costume collection that I grew up with at home. Oh, and I grew up in Dublin, New Hampshire, at, uh, in a big summer house. Uh, we devoted an entire room on the third floor of our house to costumes. And my mother, who was an archivist by trade, she was the curator. She uh, collected the costumes first from her mother, who had traveled the world picking out exotic, exotic costumes. And then um, we got all of my parents' cast-offs from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then the 70s were awesome. <laughs> we had dresses and we had men's suits and old uniforms and hats and boots and belts and scarves and knives and swords and helmets. It was an amazing collection and they were all arrayed on hangers and in um, shelves and in boxes and so going up to the third floor to dress up was like going to a department store except you didn't have to pay. <clears throat> now you might be thinking why would anyone need such an extensive costume collection? And if my sister were here, she would say that Halloween is for people who don't dress up every day. <laughs> we used to dress up a ton as kids, and it went on into our teenage years. Um, we'd have friends over, and we'd dress up and dance in the kitchen while we're doing the dishes, just on a Tuesday night. <laughs> Big deal. And those friends, they used to... <clears throat> They used to, they really got into the costumes, and so they started to contribute to the costume closet. So we get the Batman slipper socks, we get the Star Wars Stormtrooper helmet, the go-go boots, and we got all the prom dresses. <laughs> so the costume collection was really filling up, and so was the house. It was filling up with friends who are our age, and uh, we used to organize these big three-day blowouts, house parties. Um, over Labor Day weekend, and the, at the center of those house parties was the annual croquet game. And the uh, croquet game um, always uh, had some people dressed in period dress. That would be, um, you know, a ball gown and a bonnet and a parasol. But usually the boys went for that. <laughs> and everybody else was just had mixed up crazy costumes. So um, growing up in that environment through high school and college, I basically learned that, you know, there's only one way to truly make a social event successful, and that's to dress up. And I carried that with me to Seattle after college when um, I left, uh, after college I left East Coast and went to Seattle, and <clears throat> I, um, I finally I got up the nerve to invite this beautiful woman over to my house, and I said, you know, I really got to dress up for this. <laughs> um, this has got to be special, I don't know. The whole year we've been working together, I can't. I can't really, you know, it's taken me a long time to get this, you know, i got to put my best foot forward. But it was so disappointing when I met her at the door, she seemed put out when I was wearing my Hawaiian shirt and my cat eye glasses and my uh, Shriner hat. <laughs> that was a really nice Shriner hat. <laughs> well, she didn't uh, answer my call for a while after that. <clears throat> when we did finally start dating again, I figured it out. Like, we're going to leave the costume thing at home. But I did uh, take a little risk. You know, I, I was going home for a week of vacation to go to that Labor Day party, and coincidentally, this same beautiful woman, she was going to be on the East Coast at that time. And I said, why don't you drop by? <laughs> so I'm out in the lawn playing croquet, and this strange car drives up, and it's her. I walk over to the car. She rolls down the window. She doesn't say anything. She looks me up and down. I'm wearing a pink ball gown. <laughs> a thin fur coat. My work boots and a smoky the bear hat. <laughs> she still doesn't say anything. She looks past me across the lawn at my friends who are dressed comparably. And she says, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> and there, <clears throat> in that body language, there's an ultimatum. It's like, you invited me here. Do you want to be with me? 
Or do you want to be over there with that band of idiots? <laughs> and I had this moment, you know, I realized this is a moment, right? I'm 25, you know, it's time to grow up. I'm serious about this woman. You know, am I going to let this opportunity slip away? And then I look back over at the lawn. <laughs> the earth, wind, and flyers blasting from the stereo on the porch. My, uh, <clears throat> my sister's dressed in a um, plaid polyester pantsuit, and she has green platform shoes on, and she's currently dividing up the teams to see who's going to win at the sack race and ice cream sandwich contest, ice cream sandwich eating contest, and I just can't help myself. So, as that beautiful woman drove down the driveway, all I could do was wave. <laughs> and, um, you know, at the time, that seemed like that was probably the end of that. But it wasn't, because about three years later, on that lawn in Dublin, New Hampshire, I married that beautiful woman. <laughs> it, was a, it was a fairly formal wedding for New Hampshire. Uh, she wore this beautiful satin wedding dress, and I wore a white suit. But um, that didn't stop my friends and family. <laughs> During the middle of this reception, going up to the third floor, hitting the costume closet, coming back down, downstairs, and playing some croquet right in the middle of the wedding reception. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you one of my favorite pictures uh, taken that day by Annie Card, who was in the audience. Uh, it's of um, Laura standing in her wedding dress, um, surrounded by our crazy friends. And she's got a feather boa wrapped around her neck. Her smile is just beaming. <laughs>